I always enjoy speaking with Luke Dubois. He's an amazing artist. He's also an amazing conversationalist. Every time I talk with him, I think we might talk about one thing and the discussion will go wildly a different direction. It's really enjoyable. Um, And that's about how this interview wrapped up. This is a little longer than normal, but uh, a lot of interesting information covered. So I hope you enjoy. And here's Luke Dubois. Okay, today we have uh, Luke Dubois, or our Luke Dubois, as he uh, sometimes is known. I am lucky enough to count Luke among my friends. He's a phenomenal artist, but also a really good guy to hang out with. Uh, hi, Luke. Hi. How's it going, Darwin? It's going great. Got a bit of a chest cold, but I'm going to work it out, I guess. Um, for those people who don't know you or your work, why don't you give us a little overview uh, about both your professional and your artistic career? Sure. Um, so I'll do my day job first. Um, I'm, a, um, I'm a professor at NYU um, at what is very, very soon to become N- NYU, N- sorry, um, is very soon to become NYU School of Engineering. And um, I run a thing called the Brooklyn Experimental Media Center. Um, and we have a, a program we call integrated digital media and it's me and a bunch of other folks and we teach everything from you know sound and video production to um things involving max msp to creative software design to like mobile app development all that kind of stuff in kind of a experimental research context so we partner with lots of people um outside the university we make all sorts of cool things um and I ended up there, I started there in 2008, um, and in my um, spare time, um, which is increasingly disappearing, but it's okay, uh, I'm, a, I'm an artist and a composer and an occasional software um, designer, um, and I was proud to uh, be one of the um, Cycling 74 folks for a long time, working on Jitter and Max, and so, yeah, I do all kinds of things. Yes, you do. Um, <laughs> some of your, kind of uh, why don't we just touch really quickly on some of what would popularly be considered your major work. Um, mm-hmm. So you did the thing with the presidential uh, uh, State of the Union speeches. Yeah, yeah. So I've been doing a bunch of stuff um, over the last, like, I don't know, six, seven, eight years now, where it's kind of like portraits, right? But... They're portraits that aren't like an oil painting of George Washington crossing the Delaware. What they are is they're portraits that use, um, that either sample cultural media or they use statistics or they use some kind of data input to make these kind of snapshots of um, people and places and things that are really kind of about like America, actually, about the United States and how we view ourselves, right? And so um, I did this piece for the 2008 Democratic National Convention, right, where I uh, took all the presidential State of the Union addresses um, and made eye charts, you know, kind of like when you go to the doctor. Right. Yeah, eye doctor, eye charts, but instead of letters and words, right? And so what you got is you got an eye chart for every president, and they're the um, top 66 words um, of their State of the Union addresses that they, that they use more than any other president. So like George Washington's number one word is gentleman. George Bush is terror. Ronald Reagan is deficits. Richard Nixon is truly. Abraham Lincoln is emancipation. You get the idea. Um and it's called hindsight is always twenty twenty, and the idea is it's sort of like a history lesson of America through the lens of like political rhetoric. It's also a way to make portraits of presidents without painting them or taking photographs of them, but thinking about what they say. Does that make sense? Yeah, so, that's that's yeah, actually yeah. really interesting. And um, I was just realizing because the other the other work that uh, I think you're pretty well known for is the variety of time smearing pieces that you've done uh-huh. um but you know in a kind of interesting way um that piece uh hindsight is is actually kind of a time smear as well 
Yeah, yeah, and there are, and there are, and a, a lot of them are like that. And and the way you think of it is like you know I don't I do all this kind of like it's pretty tech heavy some of the stuff I do like you do all this computer stuff and statistics and whatever. Um, but what it really is is it's about con- conveying a pretty um, kind of simple idea and showing people. You know, things that like you could imagine you'd want to know or be able to see, but you, but it would actually be kind of a pain in the neck to do yourself. So like, you you know what I'm saying? So like you can imagine seeing every single Academy Award best picture all at once, right? (laughs) But, But to do that, you would have to like hunt down one of the five remaining video rental stores in America, right. rob it, rip all the DVDs in your computer, figure it all out, figure out how to, you know, whatever. It would just, it, it's hard, right? Right. And so, um, you know, so like, yeah, some of those time smearing pieces, they're very much portraiture as well. Like Academy, which is the thing that does what I just said. It, it's every Academy Award best picture in one minute strung together. So it's like 75 movies in 75 minutes. You know that I did that in two thousand whatever five ish six ish, and it took I don't know something like eight hours per film to render. Right. So I watched all those damn movies. <laughs> you know, so, so like lived, I might you be lived that life for us. Is what I might saying. be like the only person I know who's seen every single Academy Award Best Picture, and the same thing. I did this one around um, the top forty around the Billboard number one songs, and like. Yeah, I listen to all like 675 number one songs from like 1958 to 2000 or whatever. And that was like, that's like three whole days of music or something like that. It's right. like not cool. Um, and, you know, but it's interesting because once you transform them the way I transform them, which is you sort of time lapse them almost, um, you know, it's you see you look at that piece you look at the piece i made and and it's not like it's not it's no substitute for having sat through them all but it shows you something different it shows you something that you can't notice by having watched them all so like with the academy award thing it's like you see the acceleration of american culture is played out in the acceleration of editing processes in cinema so like the movies from the 1930s the actors, it's kind of like still like theatrical proscenium style acting. They're all standing still. The shots are like 30 to 40 seconds long. There's minimum editing. And part of that's just the technology that can do it. But, right. you know, they're all kind of like doing their thing and they're gesturing like they're on stage. And then like you hit on the waterfront. And then on the waterfront, there's like Marlon Brando and the fucker never stands still. <laughs> He's constantly moving. Right. So in my, my little weird treatment of it, he's blurred like you can't actually like see him seen. whereas yeah whereas when you go back to casablanca like you can totally see humphrey bogart he's like in every shot right. and you can totally see you know ingrid bergman she's in every shot so once on the water by the time you get to the 70s by the time you get to the french connection like when you see the french connection sped up you can't even tell gene hackman's in that movie <laughs> Because he never stands still. He's, you know, and the, and the camera never stands still. And so by the time you get to like Chicago and stuff like that, you can't even tell what movie it is because the cuts are coming so fast that it just looks like this weird blur of color. And once in a while, there's like Catherine Zeta Jones for like 0.8 seconds and then it's gone. And it's like, I don't, I don't know. It's, it's, it's just, I, I don't really know what it says, but it's interesting. Um, you know, I have this, um, you know, this guy too, but, you know, we have this buddy, Kurt Ralski, right. um, who, you know, is a really great, again, like sort of musician slash artist slash whatever, um, who, do, who has these really great kind of cinema pieces. And, and a lot of his stuff is, um, you know, based on existing, looking at existing cinema through this kind of computational lens. And he, I think he actually did, he actually did the like real numeric breakdown on some of that stuff. Like he can tell you like in 1939, the average length of a whatever, you know, of a shot. Dive dive into color space. Yeah. Or something like like that. that. Yeah. I think it was something he did with his students. I just kind of did it really informally when I made that piece, like the 75 movies I used, I kept tabs on, but I think he did something kind of like, pretty rigorous with like a few hundred films. 
Supernova. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, which is kind of cool, you know. Um, but yeah, so those things are like, yeah, they're like portraits, you know. So some of them are video. Some of them are video I make. So like I, I, I have a bunch of pieces that are looking at like, what does it mean to take a portrait of a performance, right? So um, I have this piece called Fashion Delayed for the Relationship that I did with um, a woman named Leon Cifuentes, who was my partner at the time. Um, we, we did this three-day-long film shoot of her three-day-long performance on a traffic island. And then we sped the whole damn thing out to, like, 72 minutes or something like that. So it's, like, 72 hours and a 72 minutes. Um, you know, and we've got, um, and so if you're at the perform, so it's like, you know, like, and I have this pet peeve, right? You probably have this pet peeve too, that like, you know, people think watching like a video of a performance is the same thing as being at the performance. Absolutely. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yep. And it partly gets in music, it gets muddied all the time by the record industry, by the fact that like, there is this other thing that's like the studio record where like, yeah, that, that was the performance. Cause there was, there was no, there, it's not the same thing. Right? right. Those are like, people are finally, I think people are starting to get more and more in line and getting to grips with the fact that like music, the recording art and music, the performing art are not necessarily the same thing at all. Yeah. Um, and there are, you know, people who are good at both and there are people who suck at one or the other and it doesn't really matter. Whatever. Um, but like, you know, but it happens a lot in dance and it happens a lot in theater, right? Where like, you know, you watch the videotape of these people doing Hamlet and you think that was as good as being there and it's not. Right. And so, but you do want to be able to portraitize or do something about, do, do something with performers where you document them. And so that whole acceleration thing is like another way of doing it, right? So with Leon, it's like, you know, if you were there, whatever, 4th of July weekend, 2007, on that traffic island, you would have seen a woman doing this kind of self-directed piece of performance art in slow motion, right? It would have looked like um, a person moving really, really slow on a traffic island. Um, and then if you see the movie, you see this whole thing where it looks like she's moving normally and everything else is flying by because I sped up the whole movie, right? Right. Um, so it's like, you know, but that's not the performance and I'm not pretending it's the performance. If you missed the performance, you're like shit out of luck, man. Right. You didn't see it. Well, um, it's I, something think, else. I think you're right. There's, there's something now people are starting sort of cottoning to this idea of the performance being in the moment and trying to capture the performance per se is just, we're incapable of doing it in any use. Yeah. Way. Yeah. But I, yeah. I'll tell you, it's fashionably late to me was a really uh, a groundbreaker because it was, um, first of all, it wasn't documentation of a performance per se. It was more uh, the active participation of an of an artist in a in a media art trick. I thought it was yeah. It was sort yeah. of like if a if a magician. You know, like a yeah. magician calling up an audience member, but that audience member is a is an a knowing participant in the pro yeah. process. Yeah, totally. I mean, that's that's a little bit about you know, there's there's this kind of fun thing that happens when you um when you when you put on like your filmmaker hat or whatever, and you right. collaborate when you collaborate with people in the performing arts because they're um they're very suspicious of it. They're kind of like that whole camera thing is kind of the enemy because it's, it's to a degree the thing that's putting them out of a job, right? right so, sure. um, you know, so especially people who don't, you know, she's, she's like a theater performer. She's not like a movie actress. Right. So she sort of looks at it and she's like, okay, what the fuck are you going to do? <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, okay, so this is, you know, this is like we're going to do this kind of weird thing that's going to look like – something totally different than what you actually did, but it's going to work at the same time and whatever. Um, I did this, um, I did this one in new Orleans right after expo when we did it in New York, like right after I left you guys, I was in new Orleans. I did this thing where I took like 350 high school marching band kids and split them up into teams. And we did this parade, um, where they were up to a mile apart, all converging on a park. And I set up a radio tower, give all the drum majors a click track so they were in sync even though they were a mile apart and they all converged on this place 
and we filmed, you know, we filmed the crap out of it. It has like a 60 person film crew. Um, and we made a charity DVD to raise money for this after school program called the Roots of Music, right down in New Orleans. Oh, that's and yeah, it was really cool, um, which is a, and Roots of Music is awesome. They're an after school program for at risk kids, um, teaching them marching band instruments. Right, because right. if you can get a, if you can get into a marching band in New Orleans, you can get into college. Right, right. So it's it's a it's a really great way up. It's it's a very very serious part of the um, the culture there, but also the academic culture there. Um, playing in these bands, and so this bands like they play the Rose Bowl, right. and they play. You know, they right. do all these parades, and and they actually get paid. High school bands in in, in New Orleans get make money. Oh, really? Right? You can make. Oh, off it. Yeah, you pay the, yeah, you pay the musicians. Yeah. You don't pay them a lot, but you know, you get paid for, you know. And I don't think that they get paid to do like the football games. That's the theoretical right. point of their existence. But right. I think, you know, but they pay, they play parades and they play parties and whatever. Sure. And you know, you get it's a gig, you know, you, you go home with like twenty, thirty bucks. Yeah. And so um so I did I this. Wish, piece. I wish I could get twenty or thirty bucks for some of my gigs, man. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> I know, and there's like thousands of people there. I mean, it's like they have more, they have bigger audiences than pretty much any avant garde musician, and they never even leave town. Um, nice. But it's, um, but I did this piece, and, and it was again, it was like the same thing. Like if you were there that day, you could have uh, hung out in the park, and then you got this kind of weird surround sound spectacle where all these kids came streaming in from all sides, and you know, there were just like, there was just this huge mega band in there and you heard them in the distance approaching. Or you could have followed one of the bands as the second line, but then you only got one fifth of the music, right? Right. right. Or whatever. So, But, but they then, all, like, based on the click track, they all end up converging yeah. in the center, yeah. all in sync. Yeah. Uh, interesting. That's, that must yeah. have been amazing. It was super cool. And it was, it was a little bit like a Charles Ives stunt. Like he, <laughs> you know, Char no, see, like Charles oh, Ives right. and, you know, kind of envisioned all these like pieces that would have been a total pain in the ass to execute. Right. But he knew the technology was going to be available like that, that, uh, you know, universe symphony is like, you know, six symphonies on six continents linked by radio or whatever, right. you know, it's the same deal, right? It's like he, you could totally see him now, you know, if he was still alive, right. he would totally be doing shit like this. He would be down in new Orleans, on, you know, doing some stunt for Mardi Gras where he would talk everybody into, into the drum majors wearing an earpiece right. so that, like, at exactly noon they could all play the Star Spangled Banner in sync or something like that, right? right. Absolutely. You know, like, that's totally, like, in that vein. And so I wanted to do something kind of in that spirit. And it was really fun because um, I got to hang out with like probably the most phenomenal musicians I'll ever get to work with. And they were all, all like fucking 16 years old. <laughs> you know, they were just like incredible. They were just like incredible musicians wow. and they were um, super into it. And it's, and it's that and like, it's really like that thing's kind of an exercise in like cultural placemaking a little bit. Cause you know, the thing about, music in new orleans is it's such a core part of the identity for that city and you know the hurricane kind of it's not like the hurricane wrecked it or the, or the all these marching band all this marching band equipment got destroyed in the flood right so right. all these uh, companies like yamaha stepped in and replaced it but it's all, but it's really that the education system got rebooted after the flood where they um you know, charterized all the schools and consolidated them and cut all the high school music programs, which means that the bands were like imperiled right. and kids were like no longer going, who played band, band instruments were going to other schools to play in marching bands. And it got all like, it's, it's really messed up what's going on down there. Um, and it's really important to kind of sustain that culture. And so, I don't know. It's like making making a portrait of a city through the eyes of, you know, high school, school high school, middle yeah. school musicians is really cool. I'm doing one. I'm down in Sarasota, Florida, right now, and I'm doing one with um, uh, circus performers, local circus performers down here. Because <laughs> Sarasota is like the home of the American circus. Yeah, I saw uh, something that an upcoming work was at the Ringling uh, Museum. Yeah, of yeah, Ringling Museum of Art. Yeah, so that's on the grounds of the Ringling Estate. So uh -huh. John. 
the youngest of the Ringling Brothers. Right. Um, it's a big estate down here that has a huge art museum, beautiful, beautiful art museum. And what um, what's going on is um, I have a retrospective show. So I got the show running from late January through May next year of pretty much everything I've ever done that's worth a damn okay. all at once all laid out here. So like, yeah, those eye charts and all the films and a bunch of other stuff. And then I'm doing a new piece and I don't really know what it, it is yet, but I'm doing this new piece based on local performers, local circus performers. Okay. Um, so oh, I've been, I've been film, yeah, it's cool, but it's the same idea. It's like, you know, portrait thing. And it's like, you know, a portrait of a performer. What is that? Um, you know, I did this thing. I did this cool piece called vertical music where I filmed all these kids this is a classical piece. Like I wrote like this four minute chamber piece. Right. And I filmed with 300 frame a second industrial cameras mm -hmm. back at one tenth speed. And that one's a pretty cool one too. Cause then you can like see the strings vibrate and like the vibrato becomes microtonal and like my apartment sounds like a church cause all the, <laughs> all the reverb times expand. And I, and I remember like after I did it, I was like, this is amazing. And then I realized it was like the world's oldest, like Motown trick. Oh, like they, right. used to, you know, like they used to play like Diana Ross high speeds to sound like a chipmunk into the stairwell and then record it and then yep. slow it down. Yeah. And it sounded, and it sounded like she was in like an opera hall. Yeah. Um, so, so they beat me to that one. Um, <laughs> But yeah, it's uh, it's it's good stuff, man. It's kind of fun. I've been I've been rambling. Um, no, that's cool. It's it's great to sort of hear one one of the things I like doing with this podcast is is kind of diving into people and you know, how people think about what they're doing. And one of the things, like you just said, was this idea of doing a lot of doing these things, and they're sort of portraitures, but they're also sort of Americana in not yeah. catch way. Which is which is a really yeah. cool thing because I don't think that there are that many people that are paying attention to that. You know, it's sort of like after Norman Rockwell documented what we're all like, um, we don't right. want to be changing that anymore. You I know, know we still cool. think we're like that. Yeah, yeah. Right. I mean the next so the next that. one I'm doing. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to Lawrence, Kansas, in in next June to do this big project on William S. Burroughs. Right who lived in Lawrence, yeah. Kansas the last 20 years of his life. And um, I don't know what that's going to be like either, but, um, but this part, we're, we're doing a whole festival around it. Um, and, you know, that's like a, just like a trip, man. It's like Kansas is 50th in the nation for cultural investment, right? They don't even have a state park, so they don't even have a state tourism board. Mm -hmm. Right, because you forget, right. like Kansas City's Kansas City's in Missouri, Missouri, that's right? right? Yeah, yeah. So Kansas is like Topeka and Wichita and, and Lawrence, and um, you know, and so we got this NEA Art Town grant to do this big project around Burroughs. That's yeah. again like a cultural place making thing. We're bringing out all these people, and Burroughs is this really interesting. You know, he's he's not your typical conservative Midwestern guy, yeah, right? Not. Right. So, you know, we're trying to figure out how to go out there and bring out everyone's inner, you know, wife killing junkie and try to like, you know, get a whole thing around like, you know, why the hell did that guy spend the last 20 something years of his life in Lawrence, Kansas? And what is, is there a dialogue between him and his work and like the free state movement, like the sort of, you know, Kansas was the you know, was settled by abolitionists. And there's this kind of, you know, thing of like, what does it mean to be a libertarian? What does it mean to be a liberal? Um, how, there are places in this country where those two things are very much like in sync with one another. And then there are places where they're in conflict. Right. And Kansas is one of those places where it's really messy. Um, and it's really complicated. Where like, yeah, you got your gun collection. But yeah, you're also like, College educated, pro union, and pro choice. Right. Right. Um, interesting. You know, and all your friends are gay and whatever. You know, and it's like, it, it's just, it's nuanced and complicated in these really interesting ways. And I bet, and a lot more of the country is like that than we, than we admit to or that, or that the media admits to. So, yeah, I think, it, I think you're right. You know, I mean, here in Colorado, it's, it's sort of like, yeah. I think, I think one of the things that happens is when you find yourself in that environment, um, mm -hmm. you think that you found a unique place. Yeah. 
when yeah, in totally. fact there are pockets like this ever. It's it's fun how this all works out. I mean, I did this, you know, I did this thing. The sequel to the hindsight piece, right, was this thing called The More Perfect Union, right. where I downloaded like 21 different online dating sites, right? <laughs> I, yeah. I downloaded like 19 million people on 21 different online dating sites. And that was like the first thing that kind of clued me in to that incredible diversity of like thought and opinion because it's like the people, the things people say, the shit you say on an online dating site is really amazing, you know, because you got to like, you got to kind of write this like chunk of prose to basically convince people to think you're not crazy and cool and you would want to like go on a date with them, right? Yeah, you'd be worth an evening. Yeah. And so like you write this like paragraph about you and then this paragraph about who you want to be with. So in the first one you lie and in the second one you tell the truth. But in the one where you're lying, the one about you, you have to make yourself sound like interesting enough but not crazy. Right. It's got to be it's plausible like, in some way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so it's like it's, it's, so there's this, this like tipping point where like, you know, I would read them and I'd be like, oh, my God, that guy's crazy. <laughs> you know, or I'd be like, oh, my God, that woman's nuts. Yeah. You know, like, oh, my God. Or like they're trying too hard. I kind of wish I like I should teach a class on how to write dating profile. Well, that would be your most like, attended class ever. Probably. I, I know because like I, I read thousands of them. Um but one of the things that happens is like, you know, they all try to sound exciting. Like no, nobody sits there and is like, yeah, I basically sit on my couch and watch the lost. Yeah. And yeah I watched the prices. Right. Yeah. Right. 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 <laughs> which is like true for tons of people, but nobody else, nobody will admit it. Right? right. They're all like, yeah, I like to go. I like to go whatever. I like to go party. I like to go hunt and I like to go, go on. I like to go on road trips. I like to, you know, but but everybody's inner artist comes out in those things. If if you if you do anything remotely crafty, artistic, creative, whatever, that's the first thing you mention, right? Because right, right. we all know that's attractive, even though most of us, even though we're cutting music and art and theater programs left, right, and center in our school <laughs> system, all of us know that like, gee, wouldn't it be cool if we could date a musician, right? Like we're all aware of it. We're all like aware of like. The total, like, that whole, um, you know, we have to buckle down and we all have to do science, technology, engineering, and math. We all, like, kind of intrinsically know that's going to make us a less interesting country, right? right? And, I'm, and I'm saying that as an engineering professor, right? right? Like, it's like, it's, you know, but, so it's all about finding that balance and, and music is a really good one for that. And, yeah, there's, you know, there's Max, be- Max MSP is a really good one for that, right? It's like the, you know, the thing. Well, we have to find some way to sort of like get a balance because, uh, yeah, if if we generate schools full of actuaries, there we're yeah. going to end up losing population because nobody's going to breed anymore. Well, yeah, no, it's like it's like Churchill has that line, right? Like during the Second World War, they were going to cut all the arts funding as an austerity measure, and then he was like, "Well, well, then what's the point? What are we fighting for?" Right, right, right. Um. You know, and he sort of like refused. So they still had, um, you know, they still had the opera and all that stuff during the, during the Second War. World War. Yeah. So talking about, let, let's talk about education a little bit because I, I'm curious. Uh, so you teach at NY Poly. Yeah. Um, and you've, you've taught in a number of places over the years. Um, to you, uh, first of all, do you find yourself focusing or, or drawn to teach like visuals or music and sound or general programming techniques? What are, what do you find that you're being drawn by students or by faculty or, or deans or whatever? What are you being drawn to towards doing? You know, I, you know, teaching these days, um, I teach a lot of classes that are kind of a mashup around, um, a little bit of kind of engineering, like audio and video kind of stuff a little bit of performance and a little bit of just like looking at like hybrid art practice around technology. So it's like what I try to do with the kids these days is, you know, teach them a lot of the kind of underlying technology so that they can make their own tools to do what they want. 
and look at it in a kind of in a kind of platform neutral or genre neutral space. So, like, I teach this class called Live Image Processing and Performance, which um, ten years ago when I started it was really like the jitter class. I mean, it was literally like the how to be a VJ class, right? Um, you know, so it was sort of like today we're going to play lots of QuickTime movies. You know, next week we're going to learn about effects. <laughs> You know, and now it's like I don't even teach them about effects. What I do is I teach them that um, when you're working real t- with real time video or, or imagery, you know, you got sort of three degrees of freedom. You got color, you got space, and you got time. Here's like the basic equations or whatever you would use to mess with those three things. Go figure it out yourself because, you know, I'm not going to like try to explain to you how, you know, a uh, motion blur works. So that's not right. the point. Right. Point is to show you like the general math, and then we're going to talk about like why do you need it, or what does it do, or what is it, or how would you use it creatively in a performance, you know, and and then you kind of like look at scale, like looking at projection mapping, looking using more than one screen, using um, looking at interface design, looking at how people perform. I mean, a good resource for a lot of this stuff. I use the cycling site a lot, but I also use like the Creators Project. Um, you know what that is? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So like I'll point people to like things that the creators project, the creators project is interesting because, you know, some of the stuff on there is like this, are these fantastic artists doing interesting things? Some of the stuff there is very, very commercial and you learn that there's like really like a continuum now between, you know, um, like Robert Henke, you know, our buddy in Berlin, who's like, you know, premiering these crazy audio video performances where he's using basically like a, like a persistence of vision laser scanner <laughs> right. for the imagery all the way down to, and, and it's pretty, and it's pretty like out there and avant garde and whatever the music all the way down to, you know, what the barbarian group does, which is like, right. you know, a commercial design firm. And there's, and there's like a dialogue there that there didn't used to be. There used to be sort of like the weird people who would hack stuff together and, and make it work. And then there was like commercial design, which was like using Flash to make right. websites. And they're not like the same. St- it's, it's, I don't know. It's, it, we're in an interesting space now where you can um, go pretty fluidly through all these different um, you know, scenes and audiences and whatever. And people are becoming more and more literate around seeing, you know, big public art that's like LEDs and they're interactive. Like yeah. interaction design is much more in the normal kind of public sphere than it was and, you know, everything's becoming gamified and whatever. So yeah, it's I teach very, all this yeah, stuff. It's yeah. very interesting to me that um, it's it's been only recently that experimentalism hasn't been treated like a dirty subgenre. Yeah, but in, yeah. It's something that informs everybody. I think that that's yeah. a really interesting change that's occurred, and it's been recent. Yeah, no, and that's and that's you know the place I run at at Poly is you know it's called the Brooklyn Experimental Media Center, and Carl, the guy who founded it, was thinking of it in exactly that same vein, like like exper- like experiment. The word experimental in the arts is a helicopter coming. Yeah. Was like um, was like is like shorthand for weird. Right. That's all. Right. Like the way people say that, like, ooh, that was experimental. They're using it as a short <laughs> like weird or avant garde. But experimental in the sciences actually has like a really specific meaning. It means it means, you know, you're testing a hypothesis. It's like you iterate and it's a you form of research. Yeah. It's a form of research, right? And there's a way to kind of match those up. And commercial design is actually one of those ways, right? Commercial design is basically visual art with a scientific method attached to it. Right. Right? right, and the idea of build, and, and iterative design is all about like you know and building institutional memory around best practices for how we navigate our world and how we make things that are good to look at but also functional, right? So like right. Joni Ive, the guy at Apple, you know, is basically like a you know artist engineer, right? right. And a lot of it's, you know he knows the engineering brain knows what you know, users are going to respond to. And then the creative brain is how far can I push this, you know, to get them to make new stuff or make them, you know, kind of think a little bit outside the box. And that's really interesting, you know. Um, But there's ways of doing that in kind of funkier spaces. There's ways of doing that in, 
filmmaking and in visual performance and then, you know, and all those things that we've walking inside because we got it's helicopter time here in Sarasota. Um, all those things that like, you know, used to be thought of as, you know, kind of experimental art or psychedelia or whatever, like music videos, like all the, all the crazy, like, you know, experimental cinema techniques, you know, they show up kind of, fir- they, sh- they tend to show up first in music videos, right? And then they right. filter up into Hollywood. Right. And um, it's just kind of interesting, you know, and it's the same thing with like video games, like video games are the, inter- are the incubator for interaction strategies that mm-hmm. then show up show up everywhere they show up in um you know they show up in design but then they show up in um you know like citizen science i work a little bit um with this thing called the center for urban science and progress and we're doing um all of these um research projects around um the the urban environment and so we're working on this big thing around noise pollution in new york and the first thing we realized was to get everybody on board with um doing basically like a massive citizen science field recording, right, is what we want. We want everybody in New York City to basically like start capturing noise so we can categorize it. Um, And so the first thing we got to do is we got to like turn it, somehow turn it into a game, right, right, and turn it into something that, that people get incentivized to participate in in some way. Um, And so the big design challenge isn't, how do you open up the microphone on your iPhone and analyze the sound? The, the, the real challenge is like we're doing these design meetings where we're just like writing all these crazy ideas on the whiteboards in the classroom being like, okay, so maybe, maybe like, you know, if you record more than an hour, you get like a free download on iTunes. No, Apple will never go to that. Go for that. Right. Maybe, you know, maybe we can throw a big party in every borough and maybe we can we can partner with like facebook or something like that so you can like share them on i don't know we're we're like we're like coming up all these wacky ideas to try to encourage people to do something that's like technically really simple right right which is just to like capture and quantify some qualify some sound like you know go out and record a construction vehicle or whatever um, was, but it's like, you know, but we also want like, you know, kids with their like little Android phones, oh, yeah. like, you know, skateboarding around looking for loud things, sure, you know, sure. and, and sampling the air conditioners and whatever. Um, so I don't know, we're trying to like kind of figure it out now, but, but it's interesting and it's, and it's in it, in this media research stuff that we're doing is this kind of like really interesting mashup of like all the kind of crap that I do as an artist, but also, you know, all that stuff that came from me being able to program computers really early on and, and being able to kind of like have be empowered by having that kind of tool kit of stuff. Right. So, and that's the thing like Casey Reese, you know, one of the big, the main processing guys, um, you know, has this kind of saying that, you know, in a hundred years, like either everybody's going to know how to program a computer or nobody's going to know how to program a computer. Right. (laughs) And it's all about like, we've got this huge fight in education in the United States to make sure that it becomes everybody, right? Like everybody should know how to program a computer. They're not going away. Um, you know, we got to figure out how to make this happen so that it doesn't become this kind of like elite, tiny percentage of people who know how to use this stuff right so i don't know yeah well my question for you about about teaching uh teaching sort of creative coding and and art artistic technology back when you and i first started teaching teaching people how to use this stuff there was a very easy to understand baseline which is nobody knew anything so you right. can start at an extremely basic level and hold their hands as you walk through the gates of um, conditional statements and looping processes and stuff like that. Now it seems to me, you know, when you talk about your teaching practice, you're sort of like, you know, I'll give you the background. It's up to you to consider the how to deal with the sort of execution. But how do you know that people are meeting some sort of baseline where that actually can be viable? 
Yeah, I mean, that's, yeah, that's how you got, you have to like kind of do a little bit of that everything all at once thing. So with, um, you know, with our students, you know, we make them take uh, a sort of custom rolled computer science class uh-huh. that teaches them, you know, that stuff like loops and functions and all that kind of thing in a very um, kind of creative context, like they use processing to do it or whatever um and then you know but we teach them a whole kind of bunch of tools we teach them a little bit of max we teach them a little bit of pure data we teach them all that kind of stuff um so they just get around the idea that like you know a visual programming language and a text programming language and a scripting language and whatever they're all used for different things under the hood they all have exactly the same crap going on um and there's not that many um you know, there's not that many differences between them, right? Um, right, and but, then, but, there actually, yeah. but there actually sort of is one thing, which that is each one of these things, whether you look at processing or max right. or PD or whatever, each one sort of like preferences a certain kind of thing. Oh, yeah, that's absolutely true. Yeah, yeah, no, you're right in terms of what you would use them for. Right. It's just like under the hood, they're all just like right. a bunch of C++ floating around or whatever it is, you know, so... So given, it's about you know given yeah. what you're saying it sounds like what you what you teach is sort of like this breadth of activity it's sort of like yeah. um yeah. Pro, you know you can use processing because it makes it really easy to attack this or right. you can use max or you can use cinder or whatever right. um to because they're very good at these sort of specific things my question and i i ask it not in an accusatory way it's because i don't know the answer how yeah, do, yeah. How do you get beyond the um I've compiled a variation of the demo? Right. Uh, as right. as being my work. And I say that right. because this summer I happened to uh go and see a performance where literally the uh what was blasted on the big three screen thing was uh, a very slight variation of the particle system demo of open frameworks. Right, right. Now, granted, right. 99% uh-huh. of the audience had never compiled the particle systems uh, part of open frameworks, so they didn't know. I had, and I was like, you've got to be kidding me. Right, right, right. And, yeah, I mean, um, that happens, yeah. Right, yeah. and, and how, do you, how do you help people to simultaneously understand the breadth of things that are available while still having, while still going into depth in something. Yeah. I mean, that's the challenge, right? I, I think the, I think that things, I think the first, well, so like the first thing you do, right, is, is you gotta make sure that they see as much as they can of things. Like, like, like the traditional problem we used to have before, I remember, I remember like when the tipping point was where like when people, when artists started doing like lots and lots of self publishing on YouTube, right? Because right. before then, it was actually kind of like hard to find out what had been done already. <laughs> you know, like it was sort of a pain in the ass. There were like a couple books by Thames and Hudson. Mm-hmm. There was like, you know, um, you know, these kind of couple books on Macs that would once in a while talk about it. But then it was like you were kind of stuck with like catalogs of exhibitions or you were stuck with like this kind of weird, like everybody had some kind of shitty website with some photos and you had to kind of imagine. I still have a box full of exhibition catalogs simply as sort of like my personal memory of what happened. Exactly, exactly. So it's like with students, it's like you have to show them as much of that stuff as you can to be like, okay, so this is what people were doing in the 80s. Don't, don't, <laughs> don't do, do this, <laughs> right? Or if you do it, you got to figure out a new way to kind of spin it. Um, and, you know, bring in as many kind of artist talks and videos as possible. But then it's also like, you know, the thing you were talking about about the particle system is like that's not necessarily like another artist did that. That's like the demo code. Right. Right. So it's like you also have to get them around the idea that, like, you know, making nominal tweaks to pre existing software is not necessarily like as creative an act as you could be doing. Right. And it's much better 
to kind of, and we do a lot of pen and paper exercises around this specifically because of this. Like I don't let them use a computer to mock up things at first. I make oh, them actually draw it, all right. you know, because because otherwise they kind of cheat. They're like, okay, so I got the you know, particle system thing from processing and I figured out how to jack in some like connect thing <laughs> that I found and boom, I've got my connect particle system thing. And I'm like, dude, right? dude, people have done that already. Right. Don't do that. Totally. You know, come up with some other reason for it. You know, so you sort of keep them away from the computer and you, and, and you say like, they have to be like, okay, so I'm really inspired by the, these three things I saw I want to talk about whatever. I want to talk about like cool things about narrative. And, you know, growing up, I was like, a to you know, my parents are total reality TV junkies. And wouldn't it be funny if we had a version of like Survivor where, you know, I could shoot like a little version of Survivor in this department where, you know, we had a web page and everybody could make their own choices about like what happens every episode. And it's like a collaborative authoring thing. And then like, it's, it's like a hot mess of an idea. Like it doesn't necessarily make sense, <laughs> but, it, but at least it's like, I haven't seen it before. And like right. NBC hasn't rolled it out two years ago and it's, and it's whatever. And then like, you know, they execute maybe, two thirds of it. The best, I mean, the most amazing stuff we've been doing research wise recently at Poly is um, starting this year, we started a, um, a disabilities lab. We started a, an, an assistive technology research lab okay. all around client centered design. So looking at people with cognitive disabilities, um, uh, sensory disabilities, physical disabilities, right? Okay. And having the students do these kind of service learning exercises where they work with um, outside people who have disabilities and come up with solutions for them. And really like solutions specifically for them, like not I'm going to solve blindness. <laughs> it's about you know, because that's stupid, right? It's not going to work, right? Um, help a specific it's more like, find I am going to, exactly, I am going to help Sally, who, you know, is really, um, you know, who lives in like a crazy ass walk up apartment, you know, get down her staircase better. Oh, sure. And, ha right. and have it take five minutes instead of 20 minutes. And I'm going to do this by creating, you know, a kind of sensor network that she can deploy in her staircase. Uh-huh. Right, that's like a sonar system, and I'm gonna put like a little buzzer on her cane, so when she gets within like six inches of the lip of the stairwell, she can feel it. Mm -hmm. Right, and like, are we ever gonna patent that? No. Are we ever gonna monetize that? No. Are we ever gonna sell a home kit of that? No. Um, but we're gonna document it and come up with a really good best practices system for putting that online, so that other people can find it. You know, and if they want to improve on it, they can. And we, and you know, so like two nights ago, we had in the, um, they're not actually called this, but I like to refer to them as this, the hacker nurses of MIT. <laughs> there's this, there's this group in Boston called Maker Nurse okay. that is basically all these um, nurses, you know, these people who did their undergrads at MIT. So they're all engineers, okay. right? All right? And what they're trying to do is they're trying to take all that kind of like informal, kind of like DIY lore the nurses have, like worldwide. Like every nurse on the planet knows 8,000 ways to make a splint out of like, you know, duct tape, a couple of the chopsticks and like, you know, some in a busted up piece of furniture, right? right, right. They all know how to do that. They're all taught like generation to generation how to do that. Again, like they never patented, they never try to make money off of it. They, but maybe they could put it online and maybe there's a pre best practices protocol for them to put it online in a way that is kind of like an instructable right. or like an open hardware thing, like an open source kind of thing mm -hmm. where, other pe where other people can also, like a GitHub kind of thing, where people could share ideas and actually collaboratively iterate a very cool version of that. And so they showed me, the hacker nurses of MIT, the maker nurse, showed us this crash cart that they invented. You know what a crash cart is? Yeah, I do. It's like that thing that, you know, the, the sort of like it's got all the bandages and all the whatever and all the whatever. Yeah, so they dude, have one dude, in. Dude, my ex-wife was a nurse, so I have too much uh -huh. history with nursing. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So they made this hacker crash cart 
that has like you know a sewing machine and a vinyl printer in it and um, and a soldering iron and a whole bunch of like makey makeys and a whole bunch of Legos and a couple of Arduinos and like a bunch of like little little like sensor kit parts, right? So that you know with like in like twenty minutes they can basically like they can basically like um, kind of MacGyver up a thing. Where like any you know where like the heartbeat monitor can be attached to a buzzer, right? You know, and hear it or whatever. Just like all these kind of like little weird DIY things that they can deploy and learn about and kind of create stuff. And there's this, and you know, there, there's this whole push now to have maker spaces in hospitals, right? Um, to kind of make it so like there's a there's a place in the hospital where like you know the the kind of ER staff can have a little R and D lab. And they can say, like, you know, we keep having people coming in with this kind of gunshot wound. We need this kind of specific bandage. Right. And we just need to make 50 of them and have them around so that we don't keep fucking doing this from start from yeah. scratch. every From time. chopsticks every time. Right? From chopsticks every time. Let's figure out how that's we can That's really interesting. Do I've not heard about this at all. And it's that's, yeah, that's it's amazing. Yeah, it's super cool, man. You know, and it's like, and, you know... There's a role for, I mean, it's it's a type of creative hardware hacking and creative coding and whatever. It's not, it's not you know, it's not. It's experimental media. They're basically doing experimental media or experimental practice. It's just like it's just around health, right? Um, around and and they're doing and health is one of those places that in the United States is super. Um, you know, regulated and complicated and whatever, and 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 it's not easy to do this stuff. But like, you know, this woman named Michelle Temple at NYU, you know, she developed an open source heart, uh, hearing aid um, last year, and you wear it like an amulet. You wear it like jewelry, wow. and it's and it's an array. It's an array of um, passive face canceling microphones, so it's super focused. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of it's kind of like a shotgun mic, right? right. So it's sure. it's a it's whatever, like a hyper, hyper, hyper cardioid. Yeah. Um, you know, runs off a watch battery. You plug your iPod headphones into it. And you wear it like jewelry. And you point it at what you want to listen to. Right? So, um, and it's 60 bucks. You know? And if you don't have insurance, your hearing aid is like 400 bucks. Right. That's amazing. And it's like, That's you awesome. know, it's like that, that kind of stuff is really cool, Right. So well, this sort of gets into an area that I wanted to ask you about, which is kind of like the future of the art, technology, engineering world. And because when I when I sort of like scratched down some notes on it, one of the things that I ran into was a lot of this or that things, hardware or software, or or the word versus comes up a lot, right? Hardware versus software. Is it education or is it? Do we go with education or is it or is it hackerism? that we focus on right is right, it breadth right. or depth is it is it code or is it data you know there yeah, seem to be a lot of these either or things but a lot of the stuff that you play around with is both you know i think yeah. if i look yeah. at uh at the visual work you've done um certainly the the hindsight piece um but also the time phase piece it's it's both data and code that made that made that possible what absolutely thing about here is uh, the ability, the hardware of the Arduinos and the vinyl cutter is pointless without sort of like the the depth of understanding that comes from being an ER nurse. Yeah, totally, and that's and that's a lot of what it is. Like these, you're gonna see increasingly like people are, you know, so like so like what did the internet get us? Right? It's like you know the internet got us in the '90s to the 2000s. The ability of people to seize their own means of production, right? It's like anybody right. can publish, right. anybody can put out a record, anybody can have an art gallery online, whatever. Maybe the next phase of it is people can seize their own means of working with all the big data, right? So, like, I can make these maps, I can make these eye charts, right? right. You can do your own statistics statistical analysis right in the comfort of your own living room on, you know, problems that are, that you see in your community. Right. And so that's like, um, things like the New York city open data project, right. They basically got a website 
where anybody can download anything they want about like the 311 system or, you know, maps of the city, where all the fire hydrants, where all the stop signs, where all this, where all that stuff, um, you know, so it's about like lowering the bar for access for people to really, um, investigate their world using data. Um, but there's like a physical thing to that too, which is that, you know, the, the bar of entry for engineering um, and using like microcontrollers to sense and activate your world, like this whole like the Internet of Things, they call it sometimes, right. or, or ubiquitous computing, right, um, is like getting lower and lower every day. So like, you know, and, and I think, you know, honestly, I think the Arduino is actually like the, this kind of funky piece of like middle ground that'll probably disappear in the next few years and, and we'll all be using, you know, Linux on a chip. It's like that Raspberry Pi thing. Right. Is, uh, is probably what's really going to be, but because those things can have real operating systems and real compilers and you can talk to that thing just like it is a computer. It really is a computer. It's not this kind of half computer. Um, so I think people are going to, you know, assuming Casey wins his war and we can, and in a hundred years we can all program computers. What that means is we can all, you know, you know, Oh, you know, mommy wants a really awesome holiday light display on the house. So I'm going to bust out my, what'll be then $5, you know, Linux on a chip board, right. you know, which has a bunch of digital IO I'm going to wire up a whole bunch of a string of LEDs that I just got in the basement, right? And it'll be kind of like, you know, it's like my father always had, you know, all these power tools lying around and all this lumber lying around just in case. Just in you case. Know, right. uh, just in case. Just, you know, just in case, like, you know, he needed to, like, fix something, you know, or put up shelving or whatever, right? We just had all that stuff. So now it's like, now it's going to be like these big, like Rubbermaid bins of like electronics gear, maybe. Right. Well, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm, with my, I'm what my garage already looks like. So. I know, and I'm much more positive about looking at the future that way than looking about it in the kind of Ray Kurzweil singularity way. Like, I'm not, I'm not super jazzed about the idea of us becoming some sort of like mass networked consciousness empowered through robotics and technology. Like, I'm not really looking forward to that world. But I am looking forward to the world where, like, you know, your seven-year-old kid can, like, build a robot. Like, I, that's awesome. I absolutely agree. You know? And what's funny is I don't hear a lot of people saying that, that there's this, there's this almost this, like, reverence towards Kurzweil and this view. And I'm like, that's not a future that I, that, no. that sounds interesting to me at all. No, it no it's like it's it's the end of AI. It's like right. that 20-minute coda at the end of AI where, like, <laughs> there's, like, all these weird translucent robots wandering around at the bottom of the ocean or whatever. It's like that, right? right. That's not good. Yeah. That's I not mean, good at all. Real, realistically, what, uh, what I really want is I want a $5 computer that will write a really good dating site bio for right. me so I don't have to right. do it myself. Right. Right. <laughs> totally. Yeah, 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 yeah. Any day now. Any day. Have you seen the Tea Party insult generator? No. It's pretty good. That's that's not I, good I for I think I tea. saw a post of it up on Facebook, but I didn't Oh, it yeah, no, it's one of those um you know, super hilarious um you know. Like the band name generator gone to yeah, hell. Yeah, it's like huh? band name generator. <laughs> it's just like lefty fascist rhino. Oh, nice. Double crossing establishment socialist, whatever. It's good. Good. Um, well, Luke, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I really appreciate it. This was fabulous. I had this list of things we were going to talk to, and we talked about almost none of them because oh, good. Uh, okay. we went okay. off okay. on a really great, uh, in a really great direction. I have to actually, this idea of the New York open data, I, I didn't even know that existed. And that really puts New York on the bleeding edge of things because yeah. I've yeah. gotten to know people. You know, I know somebody who works for a gas company, and they were like, the amount of data we have about the world based on the location of our gas lines is amazing. I would like to have access to that, you know, but it's uh, but it's not available. And it's really interesting to hear that New York's really pushing the envelope on some of this stuff. I think yeah, I mean, that's, you know, we have, I mean, he's about to leave office, but we have a mayor who for 12 years has been about trying to bring you know, kind of like corporate business metrics to New York. And a lot of that has been around, 
you know, making sure that, you know, there's a data clearing house and there's a chief data officer and all the information is in the same freaking format. And, you know, so now it's like, you know, before, I mean, God, like 15 years ago, if you wanted to know about, you know, whatever, like how many 911 calls were made around, you know, gun violence in New York, that was like a Freedom of Information Act request. Right. You know, that was like four to six weeks of you haggling with the NYPD to get that information. Right. And now there's like a website and there's like a SQL query string. Right. You can like figure it out. And so now it's just about like every community activist in America needs to learn SQL. Right. Right. Now the challenge is flipped to us as educators. Now it's like we have to know, we have to know, okay, so that's the way they're going to, that's the way they're going to give it to us. We have to figure out. Right. Let's, let's take to, it from there. Let's take it from there and figure out how to make sure everybody knows how to get it. Yeah. And that's where it gets cool, you know. Well, it's really interesting. Anyway. Stuff. Thanks, thanks so much for your time. I really appreciate yeah. it. And, uh, Absolutely. And have a great day. All right, man. Thanks for talking to me. All right. Bye. And there you have it. That was pretty incredible, wasn't it? Um, I want to, again, remind everyone, if you have any ideas for podcasts, if there's someone you think that would be great to interview, drop me an email either at ddg at cycling74.com or uh, ddg at 20objects.com. I want to thank all the people out there listening who have already sent requests. I'm working hard to pull those together. In the meantime, search around. Search your... Uh, your innermost soul try and find people that you think would be great to interview and drop me a line or if you want to drop me a line of encouragement i appreciate that as well thanks a lot for listening and we'll catch you next week